mentioned, isn't it? Good morning. Stand together, if you will. Join together in our gathering hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. before you sit down please turn to those nearest to you and offer one another the peace of Christ Jesus a good morning hello good to see you what a wonderful Sunday to worship together sit down take your seat if you will please we welcome our guests who are worshiping with us this morning our regular members as well and those of you who are worshiping with us uh, at home we will not have anything up on the screen as you can tell because this room is so bright it's hard to read it so you will need a hymnal you will need a bulletin this morning so if you don't see a hymnal on your table you can go right back in the back and take one off the rack too as well hymnals or excuse me bulletins are on that back table and the giving box is back there as well if you're worshiping with us on Online, you can find a bulletin and you can find our giving portal right on our website as well. I would encourage everyone to read the announcements for yourselves, which you can find in the bulletin just to bring one special one to your attention. We have a person here today who has graduated uh, just this week from her master's program. We'd like to congratulate her, and that's Nicole Jackson. Give away, Nicole. Give her a big hand. She's done that in the midst of a lot of challenges in the last couple of years, so we're very happy for her. 
as well. Well, my brothers and sisters, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our God this morning, remember that Jesus Christ is here in this time and in this place. It is Jesus Christ who stands at the door of our heart and who knocks. And when we open that door and we invite him in, he has promised to come and be with us and to dwell within us. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you now to open your hearts and open your minds as we begin to worship God. My brothers and sisters, please join your minds, your spirits together as we seek God's blessing upon this time of worship this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you for your presence that is already here this day. Thank you that when we open our eyes in the morning, your presence is there. We thank you for the warmth of our homes, of our relationships, of our congregations that draw us together into the presence of Christ Jesus that we believe is here with us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we trust the fact that your Holy Spirit is here in this time and in this place, is ready to overshadow us, is ready to anoint our minds our spirits, our hearts, to open us to hear your still, quiet voice of calm and love and peace. We thank you for the refreshment that occurs to our spirits and our minds in your presence. We thank you for the word that you speak to each of us that transforms our lives. We thank you for the quiet we experience in your presence, this life-giving quiet 
that has the power to transform our thinking, root us ever more deeply into relationship with you, ourselves, and one another. We thank you for the community of faith that still has the freedom on this day to join together in your name and to praise you. May this service be a blessing to you and to us. In Christ Jesus' name, we thank you, we praise you for this time together and your presence here with us. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, please stand and join together in our opening hymn of praise. I sing the mighty power of God. It is 128 in the green hymnal. Be seated, friends. And as we continue on our worship this morning, we have a confession that we do in community because it reminds us that we are all in need of the forgiveness and the compassion of God. And as we receive this forgiveness and compassion and this wholeness, we are called to extend that to one another. So please join together in our prayer of humility, which you can find printed in the bulletin. Merciful and loving God, we confess that we acted as unworthy servants. We have often broken faith with you in thought and word and deed. We are ashamed of the evil that dwells within us and we confess that our very best falls far short of your vision for us. Forgive us our sins for the sake of Christ Jesus and restore us to fellowship with you and all your holy ones. And hear us now in silence as we quietly confess our sins to you. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen.
Friends, because we are able to trust the promises of God for us in Christ Jesus, we can gratefully affirm with Paul that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please join together in our baptismal promise. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. With gratitude and with faith, we will walk the way of Christ. And this is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Please stand. Be seated, friends. <laughs> what a beautiful picture this morning, and our ladies in pink and yellow and prints and just different colors, gorgeous mothers. Happy Mother's Day. The scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews, Isaiah, from the Hebrew Bible, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53, 1 through 6, and the New Testament is from Revelation 7, 9 through 17. Isaiah says, who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering acquainted with infirmities, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And revelations. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They crowd, cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four and living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessed, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these robed in white? 
and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more, thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this morning's lectionary reading comes to us from the writer of John's Gospel, the 10th chapter, verses 22 through 30. And when I use the word lectionary, some of you might wonder what that means. And that simply means that the Big C Church, the church that was established so many years ago, understood that not everyone had a Bible in their hand, the written word in their hand, and they would hear that written word every Sunday from a pulpit somewhere in a three-year period. And so this year we're in year C, which is the third year that we would hear this gospel reading. And so some of us might hear it and think, well, this doesn't sound very Eastery. We're still in Easter season. We'll be in Easter until we get to Pentecost. What's really going on here? because it sounds like we're going backwards from the story, from the resurrection. And yet, this is one of these scriptures that kind of gets passed over very quickly because it feels like a giveaway, like what's really going on here? What do we really get out of this? What difference does it make in my life today? And so I hope you will come to this scripture in a new way believing that the Holy Spirit is able to reveal to you something new and wondrous about God's love for you and all of creation. Join with me as I seek God's blessing upon this word this morning. And loving God, we thank you for your truth that still speaks to us today. Thank you that every day and every time we come to this scripture, there is always something new, a truth that is changeless, and yet we and creation that is changing moment by moment. Extraordinary. 
that this is how you have ordered the world to be transformed and drawn ever more deeply into you, the reality of you, the reality of ourselves and who and what we are, children of God, made in your image, made relational, and that in that beginning you looked at it all and said, this is good. We thank you for that goodness that was there at the beginning, that will be at the end, and that carries us through our lives. And we thank you for this word that we'll hear today, for the grace that it imparts, for the love that it reveals, and the peace it extends to each of our minds, our spirits, and our hearts. In Christ's name, in his authority, we thank you that you hear us and that in our humble prayer, you answer us. Amen and amen. And actually, this festival that John is talking about is Hanukkah. And this is in the winter time. So we went from the spring to the winter. It's a fast movement, isn't it? At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a little bit of background about what's happening here. <clears throat> Jesus is in a part of the temple which would have been a walled portico. And so John's gospel is telling us that these folks that surrounded him, and we hear the word Jew, and I, I don't want anyone to think that somehow this is a negative connotation of, of Jewish people or Jewish thought. What John is talking about are the people who run the temple. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the people who are fighting against his ministry and probably other folks surround him and they pretty much back him into a corner because he's in a portion of the temple that's walled off so he can't get out. So they've been watching him for a while and they don't necessarily want an answer. I mean, anybody that comes at us and backs us into a corner and pretty much starts a fight doesn't really want an answer. They just want to fight. They want some attention. They want to manipulate. They want their own way. That's what all that's about there. And I hope we admire the fact that Jesus just very calmly speaks to them. And he's able to do that because he knows who he is, where he came from, where he's going, why he's in the world. The gospel stories tell us that and where his authority is. Now he starts to talk about sheep. And this is interesting because in the Middle East, every family had a little herd of sheep and goats. And believe it or not, those sheep and goats would follow that family member or they, that shepherd or that shepherdess around a village or town out into the field simply by the sound of their voice or the sound of a musical instrument. And there's a wonderful story about how when Lebanon was surrounded 
and they were being overtaken by a particular army, that one of the ways that they oppressed the people was to take all of their livestock in this village and house them up in a pen altogether. And it was one of the ways to oppress and manipulate the people because without their livestock, they either couldn't eat or they couldn't sell, and so they didn't have money and they would begin to starve and suffer very, very quickly. Not the same social systems we have here to help people. That was their system, that livestock. And one of the women in the village, one of the widows in the village, went to the guard of this pen and said to him, I need my livestock, I'm a widow. Now that was a key word, it still is in the Middle East. A widow was someone who was to have been revered and taken care of by the community. And this widow comes and says, I need my livestock. I can't survive, I can't feed my family. You must let me take at least a few. And the guard laughs a little bit and says, you know, look at this pen, <laughs> it's full of livestock. How do you think you're gonna find yours? And the son was with her and pulled out his little flute and began to play the flute and all these little heads popped up out of this pen, believe it or not. And about 20 of those livestock followed that young man out into the village and the rest stayed in the pen. Interesting, isn't it? Of course, scientists say the same thing about children when they're in the womb, that they know that mother's voice because she's constantly speaking or thinking, and there is this copacetic world happening within the child and the mother, where when that child is born, there's no doubt who the mother is. We're made in that way. We're made in the image of God, which is that we'll hear that voice. We'll hear that voice, and we're meant to hear that voice. So why aren't these folks hearing that voice? And why is it, even for some of us, we don't hear that voice, or we don't hear that music, or we don't really feel like coming out of our pen and following God? Just this past week, we had a deacon's meeting, and it was, it was great. It really got into the book. I'm looking forward to the session meeting this week and, and hearing the session elders talk about this book by Joan Gray. But the chapter was about prayer and discernment. And I appreciated that a handful of the deacons said, I don't really know what discernment is. What is that? How do we know when we hear the voice of Christ Jesus and God speaking to us and guiding us. And you see, this is the problem with these folks. There was no sense of discernment. What is that? And I have to tell you, you may pick up a book or an article that gives you, here's A, here's B, you get to C, this is how it works, and you'll see this and this and this. Discernment is not a formula. Discernment is something that happens to us when we practice being in the presence of God in a contemplative way. And when I say contemplative, please don't be turned off because many of us have positions or lives where it's busy all the time. From the time we open our eyes till we go to bed at night, it's busy. We live in a noisy world. We constantly have our phone or some technology or some noise, something that's all around us. How can we start to think about being contemplative? But I guarantee you, should you begin this type of practice, it won't matter where you will be. Once it takes hold, you will always be able to go into this very quiet, deep space that is already within you to recognize that God is there to meet you.
That's what contemplation is. We have stories in the gospel where Jesus always went off to a quiet place. But I honestly believe he was able to do that no matter where he was because he recognized the Father and I are one. And the only way he could have done that was through discernment and contemplation. Now, most of us, when we think about prayer, we think, well, we go to God, we say this and this and this, we might say hello, we might say glad to be here, thank you, whatever. None of that is wrong. Trust me, none of that is wrong. And we all start somewhere, right? We all start somewhere. But if we consider it, most of our prayer is functional. And when I say that, I mean that we come to God ego-centered, I-centered. I need, I want, I need you to do this. You know what I mean. That's kind of how we go. We've got a mindset. We need an answer. Like Johnny Carson in the envelope. That dates me. And since we go to prayer in that way, for the most part, right, functional, hoping to get something out of God, it's actually a form of manipulation, believe it or not. When are you going to answer me? When are you going to give me what I want? I, I need this, don't you hear me? And we often will say to other people, please pray for me, I need an answer. It's not wrong to ask other people to pray for us. But we often think whether it's conscious or unconscious, maybe if we get a gang of people together and we all say, Amy, can I use you? Amy needs this, Amy needs this, Amy needs this. Maybe God will do it, because it's Amy. Right? So we're looking for the personal advantage, oftentimes, in our prayer. And sometimes we're thinking, if we get that, we might look good, we might sound better. It's a calculated theology. It's just function. And we might feel as a Christian, we have to do it. We must do it. Well, oh, who wants to do that? No wonder, you see, prayer has kind of dropped off the scale as being an effective attack, if you will, on secularism. Now think about that. Think about what influences us more, influences us more in this world. The mind of Christ? or secularism. And if we don't have that contemplative mindset and we're able to discern, we can't always recognize when other things are taking over. And basically what a contemplative mind is, is it's a Christ mind. It's a Christ-centered vantage point. Because the truth is, when we go to God with a functional prayer, when are you going to tell me what it is, X, Y, Z? And that's why the story is saying what it is. And actually, in the language, what it's saying is, when are you going to stop annoying us? As long as we go to God with that mindset, you see, we go with the same thinking that caused the problem that we're in, thinking that the same way we solve it will bring a different outcome. And that's Einstein, by the way. We have a problem. We can't take the same thinking to that problem and think that somehow it's going to change simply because we're thinking the same way when we go to God. When are you going to do this for me? When is it going to change? When are you going to answer me? I need an answer. And that doesn't transform us. And quite frankly, like many 
people in, in the church today, whether we're leaders or theologians, we understand this as being the great grief, if you will, in our church today. That's why the Big C Church, it's so ineffective. Because most of us don't understand how transformative contemplative prayer is. And that's what prayer is supposed to do. C.S. Lewis once stated that. It's to change us, not to change the mind of God. So we already don't have to go begging. You see? We may have been trained that we need to. And Paul says, pray always, right? Pray for everything all the time, no matter what's happening, with thanksgiving. The only way to go to God in that way is already grateful that we believe God is there and going to work because we're loved, and nothing separates us from that love. That's what Paul wrote. That's what I proclaim today. And nothing separates us from the love of God, and we believe in the power of the resurrection, and that Christ is resurrected already in us, and in creation, drawing it all to himself. That's revelation, right? then we need not be afraid that God doesn't already know what our deepest needs are, what our greatest griefs are, what our incredible joys are. God already knows and how wonderful, which means if we go to God in that way, not as a function, but as seeking that intimate relationship just to be still and know that God is God. That transforms us. And you know what happens, friends? We might go to God thinking in our mind we have a need or a want, but by the time we're done being in that kind of prayerful state, we find we want what God wants for us, even if we don't understand the outcome. And even if it doesn't align with what our ego is thinking, or our personal agenda wants. We come out of that wanting what God wants because we know in the end that all shall be made well in Christ Jesus. All shall be made well in Christ Jesus. Not in us. Not in us. But in Christ. And discernment comes out of that. And I believe it is C.S. Lewis that wrote, not my will, but thy will be done. And God says, thy will be done. Now that's not to say that we shouldn't go with the laundry list we probably already have. <laughs> but it's not as though we have to speak that litany per se. For example, when I first came here and when I was interviewing, I think I had about three interviews with the committee, what I heard a lot of was the concern and the anxiety about the building and the roof, the cost of that, and what should we do. And I asked, it was Randy Mooney, and I asked Ernie, the building elder, have you prayed about that? And I said, let's go back and we'll all pray about that. And in just a few weeks, we'll check back within, you know, with each other and find out what we heard. And of course, I hadn't been here that long. And this was after I was installed. So we talked about it during the interview process after I was installed, of course, it was a big part of the conversation and committee. And I wasn't here that long, so I didn't have the same emotional attachment to the building, you see as our good members. But I knew that God already understood the building, already understood the finances, already understood the hearts of the people who longed to have something different and fresh and new. I didn't have to have that answer. I knew where it was. And so I began to pray for my people who were praying and for myself that I would hear and not be afraid in that answer and not be afraid to lead in that answer that I would hear and that it would be validated in our conversations. And a few weeks later, 
when I checked in with Randy and Ernie, they both said the same thing. We're supposed to fix the roof. And I said, I heard the same thing. Let's fix the roof. It's going to be okay. It really will be better than okay. That takes a lot of courage to believe we hear that. And not long ago, I was personally praying and whining, I have to admit that, to God with a laundry list. And you know what I heard? You already know what I ask you to do. Fix the roof. And I said, yes, you're right. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I do know that. My brothers and sisters, it's really not hard to discern, but it takes a desire to be in an intimate relationship with God that takes us ever so much more deeply where we will be willing to surrender the I want, I need, they want, they need, because we're terrified of letting go and surrendering to God for what God wants. And because underneath all of that, we often think God won't show up, God will let us down, there won't be an answer, it's going to fall apart, I'm going to suffer, but here's the thing. We often won't come to that place of intimacy unless we've had a wee bit of suffering. Because until that happens, we're always operating out of what's a false self. Once that mind of Christ takes over in us, the fear really does start to go away. And the confidence that we can have in the ability of God to work in our life and in the lives of the people we're praying for and in the things that we most desire to have happen happens in a way that just blows anything out of the water we could ever imagine. The problem with these good folks in this gospel story is the same problem we have. We just can't believe that God's going to show up and love us as much as God is going to love another sheep in the fold. We honestly can't believe sometimes that we can hear a voice that speaks so uniquely to each mind and each heart because we are so extraordinarily loved. And the reason is because we often project onto God the way we feel, not the way God feels about us, you see? So if we can't go to God in a quiet and a still way and believe that somehow this true, faithful practice leads us into a transformational relationship with God and with ourselves that desires that we live now, in this now, in our saved self, in our resurrected self, right? So that our prayers and our decisions and our thinking, and our buying, and spending, and saving, and our hopes, and our plans are all directed by Christ Jesus. And if they aren't, we will suffer more. I have to tell you that, because I've done it enough in my own life to know that. But every single time we turn to Christ Jesus and trust the fact that he will be there to meet us and show us the way that he will be. So how does it start? It's different for everyone. And a lot of people think that they can't practice contemplative prayer because they can't get still. So take out the word contemplative, if you will, and use the word intimate. And when you want to be intimate with a person, I'm not talking sexually, I'm talking emotionally, you still everything else around you 
So that's the only person that you see or feel in the moment. Many of us can say we've experienced this if we've fallen in love and we're in a big room of noise and that's the only person in the room that we see, we zero in on. Might be a child, might be a friend, whatever. Well, that's how God is with all of us. Zeroes in on us with the noise and the complication of the entire world and begins to work. So how do we get there? There's a wonderful, simple way to do it, two ways. One of them I taught you when I first got here, but it's worth a repeat. It's remembering the Jewish thought that when we are born and we begin to breathe, that we breathe the name of God. <gasps> That's a practice and a belief of prayer in the Jewish faith that from the time we're born, we speak the word of God. Yahweh. Do that with me, will you please? Take a breath in. Yahweh. Do it three times. Yahweh. 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 Does that make you calm right away? That presence of God, you recognize that there. Isn't that amazing? That's why there's no vowel pointing in Yahweh. Your tongue never touches the top of your mouth, so you're able to breathe in. Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. The other way to consider this contemplative mindset is through the Psalms. Be still and know that I am God. And we're going to do this together. And I want you to repeat after me. And together, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. And now, be still and know. Be still. Be. It's that simple. And those are two easy practices that you can do anywhere. No matter if it's quiet or noisy or you're in the midst of great peace or you're in the middle of a meeting or a traffic jam or whatever it is, where you're able to say, Yahweh, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know, be still. Be. And I would encourage you to begin to practice praying in that way, recognizing that God's love is there to meet you exactly where you are. You don't have to corner God. You don't have to demand from God. You don't have to think that somehow God's standing in the corner wringing God's hands, I don't know how this is going to work out. <laughs> That's us. God, right? And to recognize in John 15, we don't hear it here, but I would encourage you to go back and read it. Jesus Christ talks about you and I are one. I pray that they too will be one in us and that we all may be one. That's the goal, friends. And that's what prayer is meant to do to draw us into this oneness, if you will. Thank you, Michelle Perlman. That we recognize we are already one with God in Christ Jesus, and there is nothing to fear. And that we can be transformed, and we can discern, because the mind of Christ begins to take over our thinking, and we find we want nothing less than what God wants for us us, knowing that if we're praying in that way, it goes well for us, it goes well for everyone around us, you see how it goes. And that's how the kingdom of God expands and grows in the world and transforms us. And so my brothers and sisters, I hope in this coming week you might f use those two practices. Go to God with the Holy Spirit and ask what might work for you. Trust the fact that God already has a practice to give to you 
so that you grow in that way and to allow the discernment in the mind of Christ to take over your thinking and your decision making so that you might live a life abundant in the joy of God that Christ Jesus has come to give to all of us. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as you might ponder the ways that God has spoken to each of you this day, I would invite you to stand together and join together in our hymn of grace, God our Father, we adore thee. be seated friends and as we come into this time of prayer we recognize that God is already here before a word is even across our lips before a word is formed in our mind God already sees us wholly and fully loves us forgives us meets us where we are ready to listen And so we come loving God, not begging, but believing. We come desiring to be intimate with you, to recognize you, to be still and know that you are God, still our spirits, loving God. We thank you. We praise you for this time of worship. We thank you for the freedom that we have after not being able to worship together. We thank you. We thank you for the resources we have at First Presbyterian. Thank you that you established this church so many years ago. Thank you for the people that you still call to be part of this congregation. Thank you for the gifts and the talents and the time that are offered to you and the people of First Pres. Thank you for the ways that you call us to ministry. Thank you for guiding the ministry. Thank you for the wisdom and intelligence that, gets <clears throat> that <clears throat> guides our decision making on session in the deacons, in committees. May we continue to be prayerful, prayerful, contemplative, being still before you, allowing you to explore our minds, our wants, our needs, our hopes, 
her fears or joys. So that the mind of Christ Jesus will take over our mind and we will not fear that but welcome it. And we would desire it above all else because in doing so, the fear is eased, the worry lessened and removed, the anxiety quelled, and we might know the path to take, the decisions to make, the answers to have, and if we don't, to be willing to simply be still. We thank you for the gifts, the talents, and the time, and the resources that we have at First Presbyterian. Thank you for what's come in this week, for the legacy that we have. We thank you that it sustains us, and yet we know we may be called to more and greater things. And so as we dedicate the gifts to you this morning, we trust the fact, loving God, that you call people forward who are willing to humbly ask, how might these gifts be used to relieve need, to expand the kingdom of God, to proclaim the good news? And that those good folks who will use these gifts will be guided by your spirit your sense of compassion and judgment and peace and mercy so that the gifts always will be used for your good, the good of people, the good of the world, the good of the church. And we thank you, loving God, that as we lift all of our joys and our concerns to you this morning, those that are listed in the bulletin, have come through the prayer tree, and those specific to each heart and each mind that we keep in silence there, that you hear us. So we take a few moments of quiet to gaze upon you, your presence, to accept the love that you have to give to each of us this day, to allow your peace to surround us, and your goodness to transform us. Thank you, loving God, for this congregation. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for this time and place in which we have been placed by you for your purpose. May we always be willing to seek that purpose and to relish it, to seek your wisdom and intelligence that guide us ever more deeply into your purpose and to recognize it's about transformation, intimacy with you, ourselves and one another, that there will be a lessening of pain and suffering, a violence of thought and word and deed, and a desire to draw more deeply into relationship with you, ourselves and one another, so that we might live in the abundant joy that Christ Jesus has come to give us. As we lift our deep joys and concerns this day to you, our loving Abba Father, our Creator God, we trust the fact that you take all of it into yourself. And we believe by the power of your Holy Spirit that life truly is transformed so that we might rest assured that in the end, that all shall be made well, all shall be made well, all manner of life 
within Christ Jesus shall surely be made well. And we believe you hear us now in the prayer that Christ Jesus has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we close our service today, please join together in our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art, 147. Brothers and sisters, remember you have a great and living and resurrected God within you. You have the kingdom of God within you. You are called to take this out into the world and to never be afraid. For it is Jesus Christ who strides out before you. He goes ahead of you. He prepares a place for you. He waits there for you. And when you lose your way, I guarantee you, he will turn back on that road to meet you. And I bless you now in the power and in the love and in the peace 
of our living, loving Creator God, our Abba Father, who does love you more than you could ever imagine. And Jesus Christ, who is the living manifestation and revelation of this life, this truth, and this way. And the power of the Holy Spirit that has the power to bind you to God and to one another. Hallelujah and amen. I hope you have a wonderful day today and a better week. God bless you, friends. Amen. <clears throat>